Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, for our virtual uh, second panel for, for GIF this year in 2021. Uh, we have a great panel. I'll introduce them briefly, though most of them uh, are well familiar to, to our members and, and to those of you in attendance. Uh, this is the panel on climate change, uh, risk and resilience. Uh, we call it facing the facts. Uh, that, that is quite a statement, but uh, certainly what, what we want to be able to discuss here is how the different perspectives from across the industry uh, and, and how we, uh, whether it's from the banking side, whether it's from the insurance side or the academic side, the research component, uh, can come together to develop and implement uh, solutions, uh, whether through our products, our, our banking, our insurance products, uh, or, or through specific research, but also through um, contributing to shaping the national uh, narrative surrounding climate risk, climate change, and, and what we in insurance uh, like to call uh, extreme weather events and the impact of those on systemic risk and so forth. Um, you've seen uh, our, our panelists' names and so forth. And in these days, uh, we all can go on LinkedIn and so forth uh, to know who they are. But I, I do want <clears throat> to highlight a bit the structure of the panel and who they are. Uh, we have three rounds of question and uh, uh, one directed to each one primarily of our three panelists. And then uh, as we go from one question to the other, there'll be uh, a response from the two other panelists on those issues. Really looking again at the primary perspective from the primary respondents, so for example, Tim from a financial sector, uh, from the, se the, the, the sector-wide uh, perspective, uh, Susan Holliday from, from that of an insurer, reinsurer, and so forth, a uh, global perspective, and then Carolyn Kuski uh, from that of an academic and a researcher in, in some of these key areas. Uh, so uh, the first question will uh, be to Tim, to Tim Adams, just to introduce him. Uh, Tim, of course, is the president and CEO of the IIF, the International Institute of Finance. We're very proud <clears> to be uh, working in partnership with the IIF and uh, other trade associations from uh, the insurance world and, 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 and the banking community uh, on developing uh, our industry's response to uh, climate change, climate risk, and extreme weather events. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, Tim served um, as managing director of the Lindsay Group early in his career. Uh, he was undersecretary for international affairs at Treasury. Uh, he served uh, under um, John Snow and Paul O'Neill. Uh, and uh, of course, at, in that important position, he was the point person on issues of uh, currencies, uh, international finance issues, exchange rates, and, and G7, and so forth. Um, prior to being uh, uh, undersecretary, uh, he actually served in the reading the notes here uh, in, in, in the first president Bush uh, in the Office of Policy Development. And and something that I remember from early in my, in my career, the, he was a co-founder of the G7 group, uh, which uh, was a Washington-based advisory firm. Uh, so uh, hopefully I made sense there, uh, Tim, as I was not only looking at your bio, but remembering <laughs> those those great times early in my career where I, 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 I'm just so excited now to be able to, to host you here on behalf of the IIII. Uh, our first question for you, uh, uh, and it's really to, to looking at the work of the working group. And, and again, this is a great cross-industry finance and banking and insurance and so forth. I uh, wanted to know a bit if you could tell the audience about the IAF's climate change uh, working group, uh, who you're trying to reach, what are some of your goals, uh, and so forth. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. It's a real honor, real pleasure to be working with you and with the industry generally. Uh, the IF is composed of uh, 450 institutions we run across the full spectrum of financial intermediation, including the top 35 largest insurance companies and reinsurance companies in the world. Many of them sit on my board and I'll see them actually uh, very soon. So thank you for allowing me to be here. The, the climate and sustainability agenda has been our fastest growing work stream over the last several years, starting really with Europe, which has been the industry or global leader. Uh, with respect to climate generally and climate finance specifically, uh, with a, you know a very uh, ambitious and uh, uh, detailed uh, work stream over the last several years, and because of that, we have a, a, a global sustainable uh, working group uh, encompasses over 200 institutions, but been mo mostly focused on on Brussels. But you know, look, over the last year, more and more countries have made uh, climate uh, and emissions reductions pledges whether it's Japan or China. And uh, and so we've really broadened out, uh, given that we are a global institution, climate is a global problem and requires a global solution. 
really working in a number of different jurisdictions and capitals around the world. And then that leads us to our U.S. climate working group uh, here, here in Washington. And I started this last summer uh, uh, reaching out to a number of different financial services trade associations in anticipation of a possible change of administration here in Washington, knowing that if you do have a new administration, a Biden administration, we'd have a very different trajectory with respect to climate uh, embracing and returning to uh, the Paris Accords, uh, which happened just this week, uh, and you know, the, a, a completely different paradigm shift with how we think about uh, climate. But it didn't just start there. Really, what we're, we're reacting to is demand from our clients, from our customers and from our shareholders, from our employees, from our stakeholders. As I've told the Wall Street Journal and others, we respond to market signals. There is huge demand for sustainable products, for green products, for climate-related uh, products. And it's uh, it's our duty and it's our, being for-profit institutions, we need to, uh, to respond to that uh, demand. But I'm very excited about what we're doing. We're really focused on sort of broader climate-related issues, which how do we think about climate generally? And we are in Washington. It is a political environment, a very charged political environment. So how do we sell climate-related policies uh, to a part of the town which is still fairly skeptical, if not hostile? So we need to find ways to explain uh, both the problem and solutions in a way that runs across the political spectrum. And the two really begin to think about how do we engage as, as an industry, uh, the importance of science-based research, the importance of methodologies and metrics and taxonomy and data and all the building blocks by which we'll construct and respond to uh, regulatory uh, uh, responses, regulatory admonitions, regulatory directions, but also finding ways to work with the new administration for market-based solutions. Uh, you know, there will be some situations where uh, uh, regulation will be required, uh, and we want to work with officials, and the response from the incoming administration has been really fantastic. And there'll be times where we really want to show leadership, and we think there are market-based solutions. We've been working on voluntary carbon offset markets, uh, which will roll out in the next few weeks, uh, as well as other market-based uh, uh, solutions. So I think a combination of the industry being creative, a uh, combination of responding to our clients' needs and demands, and then engaging with uh, policymakers at federal and state level, level we can craft uh, smart policies to, to address this really the most important uh, policy challenge, I think, of our professional careers. Thank you, Tim. I, I will ask you just a quick follow-up. Uh, you mentioned the Wall Street Journal, and and there's been you know, skepticism, maybe, or, or or some folks telling us, well, you know, be, why are you going there? You know, and, and one thing that you and Sean Kevlin, our, our CEO at Triple and, and others uh, on the group, have said, well, the conversation is taking place. Uh, some of these uh, regulations regulatory uh, considerations are going to emerge anyhow. And, and I think one of the things that you've emphasized and that Sean has emphasized uh, is the need to be at the table and that uh, by just looking away, it's not going to it's going to solve the issue and that and that there are examples in the past where we actually would be better served uh, by being at the table. If you could kind of uh, expand a bit on that and, and, and maybe in a way respond a bit to, to some of, uh, of those friendly, you know, friendly commentary from other parts of the industry. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we, we can't hide. And there are some who think that we can, that if we just, uh, you know, don't answer our phones, that uh, the Washington will forget we're here and this issue will go away and be overtaken by other events. That's that's naive and a bit foolish. This is from the incoming administration's top policy issue beyond addressing the, the pandemic and, and restoring economic growth and activity. And which should be their number one priority. But if you think about what growth could look like in the future, green growth, sustainable growth is certainly an objective from the Biden administration. And we want to be a part of that. So I, I don't believe in hiding. I believe in embracing. And I think we have a good story to tell. We at the IF and many of our industry uh, have been working on sustainability for years. And in fact, the insurance industry has been talking about climate since the 1970s. So you, it's not, well, we just woke up on November 4th and said, this is an issue and we need to be smart about it. We've been working in Europe and other capitals for many years. And that's the other issue. It's not just being at the table in the U.S. It's the U.S. being at the global table because there have been first mover advantages from Europe and, and other countries. They've, you know, when it comes to taxonomy, what, what is green? Uh, there's a 500 page document, uh, a European document that defines what is green. Are we going to import that uh, into the U.S. And, and embrace it? Or are we going to write our own uh, taxonomy? 
if it's our own taxonomy, then we have fragmentation. How do we avoid that? So part of it is helping the U.S. You know, get on the on-ramp to what is a fast-moving uh, lane of traffic with respect to policy, not just Europe, but globally, and begin to shape what a global perspective looks like. So we have global standards and global harmonization and global consistency. If you have 180 different uh, uh, protocols, regimes, and definitions, uh, solutions won't go anywhere. It, 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 will, it will fall from its own weight. Thank you very much, Tim. Actually, I'm, I'm going to segue from this to, uh, to kind of follow specifically uh, with Susan and with Carolyn. And, and if you uh, bear with me, I'll give the full introduction to Susan uh, afterwards and Carolyn when we have the question directly. But again, they are well known to most of the audience. But uh, Susan, you, you, of course, have been in Europe uh, a long time. You're now based here uh, in the United States in Washington, D.C. at the IFC. Uh, where you're involved with the international uh, portfolio, private equity portfolio of the IFC into uh, insurance companies globally. But but you have worked uh, in Europe uh, on the global basis, emerging markets and so forth, reinsurance and insurance. And so so it would be interesting for you if you could, from, from that purview, uh, that perspective, share with us a bit how important it is for uh, the financial sector as a whole to, to, to talk with one voice. And maybe a bit discuss the, some of the differences that we were hinting there in terms of the American perspective uh, and, and the European perspective and the importance for both sides of the Atlantic uh, and beyond to actually uh, come together and, and again, try to come up with a, a combined, a unified narrative or as unified as possible. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. So for me, climate is an issue which is both totally global, what happens in one country or one continent can have an impact that does on the rest of the world, but it's also intensely local. So people care about what happens in their state, in their town, um, in their city, and, and they should, and I think that's a good way um, to get engagement, because floods and hurricanes and tsunamis and other things like that don't care who you voted for they don't care what color your skin is they don't care if you're a, a woman or a man uh, what religion you are or no religion um, or, or anything else so this is something that people um really should be um motivated to um act on and in fact um even just out of self-interest um if if nothing else so um in my view we need to look at it in terms of prevention and mitigation, as well as ways of compensating when these bad weather-related events um, take place. But to only look at compensating after the event and ignoring the other two angles, I think is, is not sustainable and it's, it's, not, it's not possible um, in a way that either the private sector or indeed governments um, can actually um, afford. From the point of view of insurance companies, they really have, they play in this in three ways, I think. Um, first of all, as underwriters, either directly writing business um, that is impacted um, by climate, or maybe other lines of business, but which are indirectly um, impacted uh, by climate. Obviously, they have large balance sheets to invest, and as Tim's already touched on, um, a lot of insurance companies, um, particularly in Europe, um, were early signatories to things like the PRI. Um, and um, in recent years, there have been a lot of announcements of companies um, on the investment side um, looking to pursue more, if I can call it, green policies. And interestingly enough, that's kind of just started um, more on the underwriting Side. And one of the topics that I think will be interesting and challenging is, you know, our companies kind of being a bit schizophrenic sometimes between the asset side and the liability side. I would also add that insurance companies in many cases are large companies with large balance sheets and they are um, em employers um, and they have their own policies. And I do think that um, companies should act as kind of good corporate citizens and um, see what are they actually doing um, for the climate in the way that they um, in the way that they operate, um, as well as, um, you know, directly from the business uh, point of view. And this has come out particularly, um, in obviously, in recent months with COVID and less travel and all, all this type of stuff. So um, I think there are, there are many angles to look at this. And then the other challenge, which I'd just like to bring up um, before we move to Carolyn, is that to really be successful, this is not something, as Tim mentioned, that, that banking industry or the insurance industry can do on its own. 
Um, it involves um, lots and lots of other sectors, um, you know, clearly from construction um, to to energy, um, you know, and all sorts of um, all sorts of things. And it will also, in some cases, involve working with local and state and federal governments. And that's not easy. Let's not kid ourselves. That's not easy at all. Um, but I think it is um, It is very important to, ha to have a dialogue and then to really look, as Tim mentioned, when can the private sector come up with something um, kind of like on its own? Maybe it needs some regulatory changes, but it's a pure private sector solution. There may be other instances where there is a need for um, kind of other parties um, to, to get involved, whether that is, um, as I say, local, um, state, or, or federal, and that applies not only to the US but to um, you know re really globally. Thank you, uh, thank you, Susan, Carolyn. I'm, I'm going to turn to you now, and, and I will actually merge the follow-up question with your main question because I think it will uh, it will it, it will focus very much where Susan was bringing us. But uh, as a result of that, I can introduce you formally. Uh, so Carolyn uh, is the executive director of the Warden Risk Center, the Warden Risk Management uh, and Decision Processes uh, Center. Uh, we are very excited to have her. She's probably one of the leading, if not the leading expert on flood in the country. Uh, by the way, I want to mention that both Susan and Carolyn are non-resident scholars uh, of the III, and they have uh, they have really contributed to our ability uh, to serve our members and, and to generate research has been impactful and so forth. Uh, so, but Carolyn, I, I was wondering, you know, uh, Tim provided kind of spoke to the uh, the differences in perspective between different parts of our of the financial sector. Uh, Susan uh, emphasized the, re the the underwriting and and side of things across different parts of the company of a, of a carrier reinsurance. She also talked a bit about the difference between Europe, of course, and the United States. But I, I'm going to change things here a bit. I'm actually going to ask you a question mm -hmm. as, as a researcher. Uh, when you generate research on whether it's NFIP and so on, you've done this again uh, for, for a number of years. Uh, how has it changed over time? But also, uh, when you work for for the banking side of it, or when you work for the insurance side of it, or different parts of the insurance industry, you now is there a different way of approaching these issues? Is there a different way? Is that, you know, you and I have talked a lot about this in terms of the importance of, of research being uh, customized, being translated uh, for for the audience. I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about you know how over the years you have you've really been able to 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 so successfully make the research that you and your colleagues produce so relevant. Uh, to, to those stakeholders across the industry. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Happy to talk about it, and thanks for having me here today. It is a, a fantastic conversation, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, you know, I think on the first point, the research around sort of climate-related impacts in particular has really taken off over the last several years, and also is being addressed by a wide range of different disciplines. So a lot of work at our center focuses on sort of social science approaches to these problems. Um, but you're seeing interest in this topic, you know, across um, across departments, across universities. And I think um, that's reflecting the fact that, you know, climate change is likely to impact every sector of our economy and impacts are probably going to worsen in the coming, coming years. And we're also going to see economic impacts as we begin this transition to a low carbon economy. So there's a growing body of research, and some of it's um, done at our center on documenting how these different impacts of climate change are going to impact markets. So, for example, we have research looking at how changing climate extremes um, impacts housing markets, impacts mortgage markets, right? Um, and you know, we've also been looking at potential impacts of climate to the property insurance industry. You know, for example, looking at the responses to the escalating wildfire risk in California. Um, and we know many tools are emerging to help manage these impacts and facilitate the transition. Um, but these, of course, need to be coordinated across sectors. So this includes things like climate disclosures and reporting, stress testing firms against climate scenarios, developing climate plans. Um, and for these to be most effective, there needs to be this consistency and sharing of best practices. And all markets are now, you know, at some part of the process of this. And we've seen a lot of movement, you know, like developing comprehensive frameworks for climate disclosure recently. Um, and that type of work is really um, exploding at, this, at, at our center, at Wharton, at Penn, and I think, you know, across academia right now. 
Um, specifically at our center, we do um, a lot of work, as you as you know, on sort of disaster insurance markets. And we have a number of projects right now that are looking at how to harness risk transfer to meet some of our public policy goals in the face of escalating extremes. So how can we link insurance tools to broader societal adaptation concerns? So one of these is um, work on how to close the disaster insurance gap, right? There's now a robust body of research that those with insurance recover better and recover faster than those without insurance. And this is really just because other sources of funding are often insufficient or too delayed. And there's also research documenting that as people have the financial resources to get a safe home and you know and recover, that's linked to other aspects of well-being because then they don't have to say divert um, money from other ex important expenditures. If you don't have the money to make your home safe, you might have to say spend less on healthcare, which would also um, be important. And so um, it has these positive impacts, spillover impacts. And there's also emerging work now, and this is where I think we need to do some more digging as researchers. But there seems to be documentation now that is take up rates for disaster cover expand in a community across households and businesses, it can improve community level outcomes post disaster. So we see better and faster recovery at the level of the community as well. So there's all these positive benefits to having disaster insurance, which is why I think it's so important that it be a part of the conversation about adapting to climate change. Um, and so we've been looking at how to help it um, better meet some of these policy goals, as I mentioned. So one project specifically is looking at lower income households in the United States. Um, there's work showing that they're disproportionately harmed by disasters and our current programs are insufficient to help them. So we've been looking at whether microinsurance, a tool which has been used globally, um, can be brought, but not in the U.S., can be brought to the U.S. to help with the recovery of low-income homeowners and renters here. These are sort of small limit, low premium policies. Um, Puerto Rico just issued regulations to enable this this past summer, but they're the only jurisdiction in the U.S. so far to have done so. So we're looking at how you, you know, what delivery mechanisms might work, how you could design a public-private approach to helping, what type of public support you might need for them. Um, this would also, you know, be a parametric policy. So we've been looking at how consumers understand parametrics, you know, consumer literacy around these issues. Um, and then I'll just wrap up by mentioning one, one other study on this similar vein, um, which is that we've just completed work with MMC and Guy Carpenter looking at the possibility of what we're calling community-based catastrophe insurance. So this would be insurance arranged by a community group or a special district that would provide disaster cover on behalf of a group of, pos of properties, which would go a long way right to closing the disaster or protecting gap. Um, but there's lots of flexibility in how you design such a program, various ways to structure it institutionally from the local government, essentially acting as a facilitator all the way up to kind of purchasing the policy themselves, which would put um, a lot more administrative burden on, on the local government. And so we've been thinking about kind of roadmaps to implementation for that. Um, so, so we're trying to explore a number of these ways to sort of innovate a little bit on insurance in order to help achieve some of these broader goals. Uh, you know, you mentioned something about uh, strong research uh, that looks at the relationship between the protection gap and recovery. And of course, you meant some of the research we're about to come out with. <laughs> that yes, you've been absolutely, very helpful, 100%. That you've been very helpful. Uh, and, and we're excited about that and our friends at NFIP. Um, if it's okay, Tim, with you, I'm actually going to go to Susan and then go to you. So just reversing a bit the order there, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Waiting a couple more minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Carolyn, you just mentioned um, microinsurance, for example, as one of those products. And I really want to also go from the general to the specific. And, and I think that's a great example. And I know, Susan, that's why I, I wanted to go to you, Susan, next, because I know you've been involved with this. We've worked together, actually, uh, in some other countries on, on some of these uh, products that are specifically for, for certain needs. And, and But the, the relationship between the issues, in this case, um, climate risk and climate change and and the need for products that are forward-looking uh, and transformative and, and that leverage technology. I was just wondering if you could speak a bit about about that, maybe using uh, microinsurance in that context uh, um, and, 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 and so forth. So I'll over to you. Thank you. So a, a lot of um, what Carolyn said um, really resonated with some of the work that IFC and World Bank um, has been doing in, um, in developing countries, um, because, you know, indeed, a lot of the issues people are facing, particularly in the climate space, are actually the same. They may manifest themselves in slightly different ways, but it, it's, um, it, it's the same thing. And it may even be actually the same storm or the same weather pattern um, that's, um, that's driving it. So um, one of the points uh, that Karen and Med I'd like to pick up on is 
um, really, and I don't think the industry has been that good at this, kind of looking at what are the actual needs that people have, in this case, um, when a, a climate disaster occurs. Um, the IFC did some interesting work a few years ago on the market for insurance for women. Um, and published um, a report called She for Shield, which is the global report, focuses more on developing countries, but it identified a 1.7 trillion US dollar market by 2030 um, in um, insuring women. And a lot of that research was based around um, talking, in this case to women, about what their actual real kind of needs and pain points um, were, and then trying to see what solutions you could come up with to actually meet those needs rather than starting with a product or even starting with what people think of as insurance and kind of saying you, you should buy this and you have to buy it and that's what that's the only thing um, that's there so i think in order to address um climate and indeed such some other risks but we need to think about um you know what is it that people um that people really need and then how do we structure the products and there's always a tension between having something that's simple and that you can get to to trigger quickly um but on the other hand it may be a kind of blunt it, it may be a blunt instrument but if your home has been flooded and you have nowhere to live and you have no money and in some cases you couldn't even go to the cash machine if you had any money um you know what 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 can we um what can we do about it so um, one of the things I think particularly for the sort of more underserved and low income communities is having products that are much more simple um, where you don't file a claim and wait for months to get it paid. It needs to be something that is almost instant. And then what's the mechanism if you're transferring money to people? Um, you know, should it, should it be mobile wallet or, 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 or what should it be um, right to, for, for that to come um, to, to operate properly? So there have been all sorts of, and I think we're going to come to some of these later, but there have been some interesting um, developments in this space um, about parametric insurance, which is really index-based. There's a trigger, um, and if the trigger is, which could be the height of water in a certain place, it could be um, a storm of a certain category, things like that. Um, if the trigger is reached, then the policy will pay. And um, there are even some... Um, interesting developments where you can have a, what's called a smart contract actually on blockchain um which literally automatically kind of generates and then potentially um can um, make payouts in this scenario now this is still a little bit in the future but it's it's possible to do it we haven't seen it um widely used um yet but i think these are the kind of things that um, as I say, particularly for underserved communities and particularly to get help to people very quickly and in a practical way um, can, um, can you know, really be useful. And later on, there, there are some other, um, you know, different aspects to this, which I can, I can talk about later on in the discussion. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Tim, uh, I'm going to go on to you now, uh, but just to put context on that, uh, what are some of the, in, in your mind, some, you know, at the, at the Institute, we are, we like to say, the intersection of academia, the industry, regulators, and the media, and so forth. Uh, and, and one of our core mission is to bring uh, academia, academic research, our non-resident scholars to the industry uh, and, and, and to really uh, unleash you know, the thought leadership component of that in a very practical way. I'm just wondering uh, if you could share some thoughts about you know, what is successful research for you? Uh, or, or where are, are there some examples of it? Are there needs that you can see that where uh, centers such as, uh, as a Carolyn Center at Wharton and other uh, institutions, uh, we work with NYU, with Columbia, for example, as well. Now, what would be some, some guidance for or uh, folks in, uh, in these uh, institutions and how to best uh, translate, customize, structure their research to really provide value add to, to the industry. Sure, great question. Let me say how excited I am just hearing the conversation with Susan Carolyn. The, the wonderful thing is that they just, uh, you know, uh, 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 reviewed the micro insurance, uh, community base, uh, paramedic. There's so many interesting, innovative products out there that that uh, have been have been created and have uh, uh, been innovated, I guess, uh, because of technology. I had, uh, with respect to the the creation of this working group, I had one CEO of a of a Southeast Asian bank uh, call me and say, "Hey, this is all wonderful, but there's a huge digital data related uh, component to climate related issues." 
and that is we use artificial intelligence and how do we think about uh, whether it's scenario planning and, and what's the academic uh, uh, foundation for the way we think about uh, risks to our balance sheets. And over the next several years, there's going to be huge debates in central banks, whether it's the Bank of England or the ECB or the Fed. Uh, when we begin to stress test our balance sheets, you know, what, what scenarios to use and, and what, metho what methodologies and what metrics. And so there's a huge body of work to be done there. The, the kinds of products we just talked about uh, and then also, how do you how do you price carbon, and in in what ways? Because without a price of carbon, without a way to uh, uh, to have some certainty in policy over the medium long term, it's really tough to to develop scenarios and and products. So there's an endless list of academic research that needs to be done. But centers like at Wharton or others that you mentioned, or just the work the IFC has done with respect to uh, ensuring women. You know, I think we have to think about the full spectrum. It's not just you know, a uh, huge top-down, big institution, but there's a lot of small micro uh, uh, products that can serve as laboratories because if we can find micro-insurance products that work in Senegal or in India or Bangladesh, and I've seen them there, why can't they work in South Florida or or in the Central Valley, California? So uh, it's not just the, you know, the, the high-end early stage research, it's how do we actually make it into real products for real people? Uh, and that's also a part of the suite of the products that, that we're offering our clients. You, you know, uh, Tim, you mentioned something about stress testing, and, and I remember from Basel II, Basel 2.5, the conversation around uh, internal rating systems, standardization of risk and, and, and rating methodologies. But one area that was always a little less structured uh, was country risk. And, and, and as we're looking today at country risk and the systemic nature of climate risk and uh, climate change, uh, this, it, there seems to be suddenly we're back to that point of how do we actually go back to this element of country risk that we now understand to, to include, that ought to include climate risk in these considerations and how do we quantify this in a way that, that lives up to, let's say, the methodologies that we have in other areas of our risk assessment and quantification process. And, and to your point, uh, just what, what some of these products are doing, but also the data uh, acquisition process. I mean, we are, we're very excited this year at the IIII to really be repositioning ourselves on, on data-driven insight. And you've heard us talk about this and Sean talk about this and so forth. And we look forward to being able to work with, you know, we're already working with Carolyn and 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 and, and, and others on, on, on this. But uh, that was just my little plug there on, on the on the, yeah. of the thing we're doing at, at IIII this year. Um, I, I'd like to, um, to, to I think we, we just hit a really exciting component there and I'd like to take a little more minutes than we had originally planned to talk about products uh, and 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 you because it just seemed that there was a great deal of, uh, of agreement there um, I'm gonna go back to to you um, uh, Carolyn on that and early on you were talking about when we first met uh, I remember you mentioning uh, the need for uh, a micro insurance but then selling the micro insurance but the way to link poverty and economic and equity and fairness to resilience I'm just wondering if you and and there was one in common Session we had in particular that had to do with what kind of insurance product can actually help towards that. I'm just wondering if if you've seen some of these products that whether it's what Carolyn mentioned, what Susan mentioned, or what Tim mentioned that uh, you have found promising, or or if there are some that you would like to see. If there's research that you've done uh, in the last year or so that uh, you would like folks to be aware of that could support some of those initiatives. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I think it's a really important component and. Most of the um, actual products that we've seen out there that are targeting sort of lower income households or individuals have been, you know, in the developing world and emerging markets. I'm sure, sure Susan could talk um, with a lot more expertise about, about how some of those have worked. We've not seen in the U.S. the use of risk transfer um, almost anywhere to really help that segment of the population. And we've been doing some work on our disaster aid uh, programs and policies in the U.S. And, you know, just paper after paper really shows that that's a group that's really often left out of recovery and that our, our you know, just direct government assistance isn't sufficient right now. Um, and so, you know, absent sort of radical changes in our in our public policy around disaster response, we've started looking at how the private sector and, and insurance products could help, as you say, with some of with sort of equity issues and helping 
um, provide better financial resilience for lower income households and communities. And I think there's some real opportunities there, but there's also some barriers. Um, and I think this is probably an area that would benefit from the public and private sector really working closely together because some of the um, target communities that we're most concerned about might not have enough disposable income to really pay you know, any amount of premium or only a very small amount of premium. Um, but we've seen that it can often be a, uh, really beneficial if the public sector helps subsidize premiums ex ante instead of trying to come in ex post, where there's often long delays and it's difficult in the chaos of a post-disaster situation. So there's probably, or our thinking is that there's some benefits there trying to harness microinsurance products offered by the private sector, but sort of um, in collaboration with some public sector partner to kind of reach these groups. So that's what we're working through right now with a number of different cities. Um, we have an initial report out kind of outlining this idea. So if anyone wants to look at that, it's on our website. We'd like some feedback. Um, but I think a challenge that we've also seen and a, and a gap we're trying to, to fill to circle back to sort of Tim's comments on the role of research is that, you know, often there's a lot of research done and then there's papers or reports written and they're just sort of left over there. And then there's this kind of gap to get to practice, right? Um, and so how do we help what we're trying to do with the center is sort of fill that gap and also make it not a one-way street, right? We need to be working with pro academics in my mind, need to be working closely with private and private sector and public sector partners to also understand what are the most important questions and what's the most, you know, how should we be targeting what's most impactful? So I think having those conversations is going to matter a lot. And to circle my very last point back to where I was, why I brought that up, why I was starting with this, um, is that we're also seeing that a lot of, um, you know, municipalities or other public sector groups might not be very familiar with risk transfer markets, with insurance in general, with the roles that it could play, and especially with a lot of the innovation that's happening in the industry right now. So we've also been trying to be a source of information for those um, types of groups so that there can be, you know, more piloting of these ideas to kind of get them off the ground. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Carolyn. Uh, I'm going to segue to to you, Susan. And uh, uh, you know, the great thing about bios is that they actually shouldn't just be given like they, they, they have to be made relevant. And I think the conversation has already pointed. But I just want to highlight that in your role at the IFC, uh, you've been uh, in charge of uh, one of the decision makers and the leaders on the insurance team, uh, and that you've worked extensively. On, on the intratech, and that's something that we've talked about, uh, intratech and, and, and so forth globally, and the digitalization process of insurance companies. So uh, I was wondering if you could speak a bit to kind of connect, reconnecting, continuing to what you were saying earlier in terms of different products, and, and something that you highlighted not just on, on the uh, insurance side of the industry, but also on the investment side. Uh, we've had webinars that we call town halls, for example, and, and we've heard firsthand from communities banking on the banking side as well. And how can uh, insurance, they, our assets under management be best allocated? Are there some ways for us to look at uh, a resilience bond type situation? Kind of how do we transform that concept uh, that, that we have the green bonds and so forth? So just wondering if you can speak a bit about uh, the products, but the products and, and the investment tools and what we do with our assets under management uh, to, to start developing uh, these solutions. Sure, yes, thank you, Michelle. So um, there's definitely a lot of interesting innovation. And I think we need to think more broadly than just what typically would be insurance and risk transfer, right? So you, you already touched on um, AI, for example, before, but I've seen um, a couple of interesting startups, and, and there are others, which are doing um, very interesting work um, using um, images either from planes or from satellites and AI to really look at um, vulnerability um, by literally down to the level of a building. There's one that can actually do like a 3D model of all the buildings in a certain um, town or city. And of course, this would include vulnerability to weather risk, but also potentially to other um, more man-made, um, uh, you know, hazards um, such as um, a fire and, and so on. And I think this is a very interesting area because it links with what I mentioned earlier, which is the kind of um, prevention. And now we're talking um, lots of countries, including UK, where I come from, also US is kind of talking about build back better after COVID. Um, so I think this is an opportunity to, first of all, sort of try to prevent and mitigate problems before they um, occur and to make better decisions about 
where to build and how to build and where people are living and all this kind of thing before um, a climate related event um, occurs and you have to deal with the consequences um, and, and potentially um, compensate them. And I would also um, link this into the whole debate about um, smart cities um, and how we can use data from Internet of Things and, and so on. I saw a fantastic um, presentation um, by uh, a Japanese delegation um, over at the World Bank. And Japan, as you know, is a country which is impacted by many, many um, climate-related um, um, catastrophic risks. Um, about how they um, they built a power station, for example, below the ground, so it was less vulnerable. What they did to make sure that their railways um, would continue to work, and also um, how they built a plan for evacuating people um, in the instance of a tsunami. And this actually relied on people um, using an app, and they did a test to look at the stress points. Did could people understand? Do you get bottlenecks of people in certain places? Where do you need to have water stations? All this kind of thing. Um, how would it work for people of different ages? Would the elderly people actually be able to use the app? Um, and some of it was quite heartwarming because um, the, uh, the elderly people in the in the city where they practiced it were actually asking kids, like, help me, you know, how to do this. And they were able to track where people were going, where it was going wrong, how they could most effectively um, evacuate people. So I do think there's a big... Um, and there's a big role um, for technology there in the... Um, in the kind of mitigation in the and in the risk assessment and hopefully to make some areas which are deemed either uninsurable or the premiums will be so expensive that no one can afford it actually um you know mean that you are able to um, get some kind of cover now the other area um where i think um technology um is important is in and carolyn's touched on this actually getting some kind of insurance to people that typically don't have it. Um, and it, this would range from all sorts of things like um, it, trying to improve financial literacy. There are some interesting companies out there which use, for example, gamified um, approaches um, to help um, people that maybe don't even know what insurance is, but to kind of like understand concepts and, and, and engage with them um, and help them to manage their own risks um, better. I think we need to think about how insurance is distributed. In a lot of developing countries, there's been um, success with what would be called kind of alternative types of distribution. Um, everything from seed manufacturers, where the farmers were able to scan the barcode when they bought seeds and get cover um, in the event that the crops failed, um, to using ride share companies, um, where you have the app on your phone anyway, um, to um, enable people to buy insurance and indeed other types of um, financial services, um, looking at retailers, um, looking at bundled products and things like this. Now, this is all a nice story, right? But in practice, um, it's quite difficult. And um, this is an area where there is a genuine tension um, on the regulatory side. Because in one way, it helps people, it helps society, it helps the economy if people have more insurance um, in, in this example. But obviously, there are issues about mis-selling, consumer protection, um, who is allowed, what type of companies are allowed to be insurance intermediaries and all the rest of it. But this is another area, in addition to some of the things Carolyn mentioned, where I think the US um, and some other countries um, could... Um, you know, learn from and adopt some of the things um, that have been done in developing countries, um, allowing, for example, simple products um, to be distributed um, more widely and um, with, um, you know, a, a less onerous um, regulatory uh, regime. So I think that's definitely, um, definitely an interesting area. Um, on the investment side, um, there are also um, some um, regulatory challenges um, because um, obviously insurers have big balance sheets um, and in many cases long-term liabilities um, that they want to match on the asset side, particularly for um, companies that write um, life or, um, or, or casualty. But in many cases, um, it doesn't make sense for them to invest directly in um, what I would loosely term green infrastructure um, because the capital charges are so high. Now, again, it's not easy because you have to care about liquidity. Um, you know, we are all of an age that we very well remember the financial crisis. We don't want to, we don't want to go there. 
again. Um, but there have been some examples um, in the UK where um, insurance companies have, for example, invested in green housing. And I, I do think there is potential there. But um, in many cases at the moment, as I say, it doesn't it doesn't make sense because the capital charges are um, are onerous. But that that's an area where, uh, to Tim's earlier point, I think you know different players in the financial system really need to need to come together and think. Okay, how can we structure? And I use that word, uh, you know, in, in inverted commas. But how can we structure? ways um, that mean that um, you can get more investment into resilience and as I say into this kind of um, you know risk prevention and um, risk mitigation um, area. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much Susan. Um, I'm just looking at the time and of course want to be uh, mindful of uh, the flow of the day. Um, I'd like kind of as we wrap up here uh, go back to you Tim and uh, ask you a little bit about um, the role, the optimal role, or um, of of the at the federal level, but also at the state level, in the case of insurance, of uh, the regulators in terms of um, encouraging, facilitating um, quantification uh, of risk, and, and we've talked a lot about risk-based approaches and so forth. But again, um, you know, and, and, and linking this to research, uh, the, uh, Carolyn has. has has done one of the best research out there on take up rates and and i remember uh early on looking at it and 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 going to uh the fed and the fed actually commenting on take up rates for uh whether they were the uh flood insurance coverage and some uh, mortgages owned by a like, fanny freddie and so forth and the systemic risk of that so i'm just wondering if you could speak a bit to what you think would be a desirable uh, what you think could be the role of the federal regulators in conjunction with the state regulators in encouraging a, a more structured quantification uh, of these risks and, and really to speak to it in many ways to what Susan was saying uh, in terms of using that as a way to encourage development. Uh, and there's been developments in regard to a private flood market, for example, flood insurance market. But just if you could speak a bit about what you think could be a desirable path forward and how the agencies can and the regulators uh, can act as catalysts uh, in that regard. Sure. So, we, you know, there's a huge tension between uh, state regulators and federal regulators and, and with respect to insurance. And every time we sit down with someone and, and have this conversation, you're, it, you know, it's fraught with, uh, with uh, uh, dispute and, uh, and complaint. I, look, I think there, uh, we are where we are, and I think there has to be a healthy balance between a state-based approach and the role of the federal government, and, and also a global approach. Is if we talk about climate, it's a global problem, requires a global solution. There's so much to be learned from so many other parts of the world, as, as Susan has just described. Uh, a lot of innovations going on in developing markets because there's uh, the regulatory regimes are you know, a bit loose and there's a lot of interesting innovation and, and actually they're resource constrained. So sometimes you have to be very creative in, in dealing with, with problems. So it's always finding that right balance between state, federal, and what is a global approach. We have an administration which is now signed back onto the Paris Accords. The, you have uh, Senator Kerry, who's the, uh, the, the global czar for, uh, for climate. And ultimately any solution, uh, either a political or a technical solution to climate is gonna require China at the table and India and Indonesia and Brazil. And, and so it's, it's, it's not just federal and state, it's how do we think about this in a, in a global uh, system. Uh, two is that uh, just echo point that Susan made, we, we really need to be careful in any regulation that we allow for uh, uh, innovation. And that's been one of my messages to the incoming administration is, you know, you can write a thousand page document that uh, describes every risk and, uh, you know, every solution, but you're not gonna think of them all and the industry is innovating so incredibly quickly that you've got to leave room for the industry to innovate and, and, and come up with new and, and novel ideas and solutions. And it doesn't squelch those. So the capacity for the industry listening to our clients, uh, absorbing ideas and, and innovations from around the world to develop new mechanisms, market-based mechanisms or new technologies uh, for the solutions that we've described. So it has to be, uh, uh, structure enough to give us some certainty that there are uh, that you can price these products. Whether you know, I keep going back to the price of carbon, 
if the price of carbon is is thirty five dollars versus a hundred dollars, you get very different uh, uh, trajectories in terms of product development. And if it's a huge volatility over time, that also hampers your capacity to develop products. So you need some standardization, you need some consistency, you need some federal and state regulations uh, for certainty, but you also need to allow innovators to innovate. Uh, and, and because it will, this is such an exciting field that, that we're in. Yeah. I'm gonna wrap it up with a one last quick uh, rapid fire question uh, to each one of you, uh, starting with you, Carolyn. Um, if you you have the audience, and, and you know we have, we normally, if you if we could see it, it's a great audience, and 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 it's thought leaders and industry uh, leaders and so forth. But what would be in you know in your mind from a research standpoint? What are your top project? What do you think uh, you want to get out there? What do you think is going to be the most exciting when it comes to the research you're doing, uh, the emerging framework uh, that from a regulatory standpoint we're working on, where is it that you see something that the center uh, can really make a contribution? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, you know, I think I wanna say at a high level that I think the most exciting progress and work comes from forums like this, where you get people from all different sectors together to really be sharing insights and brainstorming and, um, so I hope that we can be a part of those conversations and also, you know, host some of them ourselves because I think that's where the real progress is in this is going to be made. Um, but I think there's a lot of really important work that needs to be done um, across the spectrum of sort of where climate is hitting markets, right? Um, and so that's getting a better understanding of potential impacts and then how we can start to um, minimize them as we go forward and how we can help the transitions that need to happen occur in a smooth way that tries to, you know, um, improve and maintain people's welfare as much as possible so that we don't see these sort of post-disaster, um, really, uh, you know, difficult reactions to things. So how can we get ahead of, of lowering losses, of being better prepared, and of having systems in place so that recovery um, can be more equitable and occur faster as well? And so I think there's a lot of challenges um, as climate impacts begin to materialize. And a lot of our work has focused on those sort of impact side, but I don't want to minimize the other important work that um, Susan and Tim have also mentioned, which is like, what's the role of all these sectors in helping actually lower emissions, which has to be number one priority, right? And how do we get on track to a low carbon economy? Um, and I think on that, the, you know, the one thing we did do recently was we asked scholars about how they would help solve some of these big challenges of climate change around the University of Pennsylvania last summer. Um, and what was so inspiring to me about that is that while our challenges are enormous, the opportunities are also so vast. And you can start making positive change on any of these difficulties almost anywhere. There's there's solutions in every sector, at every scale. And so everyone can really start, um, you know, I think where they are in implementing some of these things. And uh, yeah, so I hopefully want to end on that note of optimism. Thank you. Uh, Susan, in, in a minute and a half or two minutes, uh, you've mentioned several insurance products related to resilience. Uh, which ones in your mind are the most exciting and which ones are likely to really take shape the first, the fastest? Um, interesting way to phrase the question because um, you're right, the most exciting are not always the ones that um, that take off, right? So everyone got extremely excited about ensuring coral reefs and so on. Um, and it, it is indeed um, a cool idea. And I had the pleasure of spending um, a holiday snorkeling on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So I appreciate that. But um, it, it does not seem to be extremely um, scalable in the short term. So um, I would, um, I would picking up a bit on what Tim said, I would argue for a kind of sandbox approach. And I hope that regulators will be open to that, where you can try and pilot things without getting clobbered by the regulators in a limited and controlled way. And then if it doesn't work, you either stop it completely or you have to kind of pivot in the typical startup language. Um, or, OK, this thing really can be scaled and can be rolled out to more cities, more states, more community groups, um, and so on. So I think we need to um, we need to think of it like that, because if we don't try, it won't work. And lots of countries, um, Singapore, India, um, to a certain extent, UK, for example, have adopted this approach um, quite successfully. And the thing I'd probably like to see the most um, is for the insurance industry to um, embrace new data sources 
Um, and I'm not saying that AI and machine learning is the answer to everything. It isn't because garbage in, garbage out. Um, but there are and technology is now enabling insurance companies and indeed banks um, to get access to a lot of data that is relevant to um, climate risk. And I hope that they'll, as I say, use that, first of all, to encourage um, kind of mitigation and better decision making, not only by insurance companies and banks, but by, um, you know, um, people in charge of um, town planning and all, uh, and all that type of thing, but also to um, try to um, grow the pie, if you like, of what is insurable, because we have to, um, we have to close this um, protection gap. And I think this is actually doable because this data exists. These companies exist. Yeah, they're startups, but they're not in somebody's garage, right? Um, but we, we need to, um, to me, we need, well, I don't want to say we need less talking because we need more talking, but we certainly need more acting. So some things for me are too, are still kind of too theoretical. You need to try it, right? And you need to see what happens. And the, the bigger insurance companies, which have big balance sheets, should be able to afford to do a bit of experimentation. Yes, it may not work if that is intended. Yes, you may have to rejig the pricing or whatever. But if we don't try, then you know we, we won't close the protection gap. And as been mentioned by both Tim and Carolyn, this is a huge opportunity for the industry because the protection gap is so big in every single country in the world, not just in emerging markets. So we really need to find ways um, to deal with that. And as I say, I hope that the, the regulatory environment um, will, will be supportive of that. Thank you very much, Susan. And, and Tim, I'm going to, the last one for you, uh, I and, 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 and uh, IIF and RAA and our uh, sister organizations, trade associations and so forth, uh, will keep working together uh, on the climate group. If, if we were to, you know, get together again next year, hopefully in person this time, uh, what would be the most important thing for you for the climate group to have been able to, to move forward? What's the most exciting uh, of the of what you'd like to see happen uh, this year uh, out of the group and, and, and its impact? Sure. I, I think just having a, a mature and, and, and uh, supportive uh, relationship and conversation with the incoming administration, uh, you know, joint problem solving. How do we how do we target particular sectors or pieces of what we've discussed in here today? And how do we jointly go and, and create solutions? Ideally, I'd like to see market based solutions and, and, and innovations from the industry. We'll need some regulatory certainty. We need to again, find a price of carbon. There's a whole host of things that are the building blocks. Uh, in order to do that, we need better data and deal with data gaps. We need better methodologies, consistency about metrics. We need a taxonomy that's consistent across jurisdiction. It's the whole creation of the infrastructure of standards and 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 you know the language and and the metrics and data that we use. Until we get all that done, then it's hard to do anything else. But I'm very excited. I think this is a you know a huge area uh, for our industry and for us to work together. I think our children are going to be happy that we're taking this time and really tackling one of the great uh, challenges uh, of, of our lifetimes. Well, thank you very much, Sam, Tim, and, and, and to each one of you, Tim, Susan, Carolyn, uh, on behalf of our members, uh, our, my colleagues, uh, and all of us at the III, uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to partake in this conversation today. And uh, we'll make sure that some, there were some references to websites and so forth. Uh, please don't hesitate to follow up with us and we'll make sure that's distributed. Thank you everyone uh, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.